There's something especially chilling about someone who approaches murder not as a moral problem, but as a logistical one. Here, Breaking Bad's Gus Fring carefully and deliberately changes into a hazmat suit, brutally murders his most faithful associate, and then just as calmly washes up. Gus's motivations aren't passionate, they're purely logical. Victor has to die because he was spotted at a crime scene, and that might compromise Gus's business interests. Gus also needs to teach Walter and Jesse a lesson. Two birds with one box cutter. Well, get back to work. Before we go on, we want to talk a little bit about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a superb online learning community with thousands of classes about everything. Bitcoin trading, playing guitar, stop motion animation. Click the link in the description below to get two months access to all classes for free. If Walt's evil superpower is chemistry, then Gus's superpowers are optimization and efficiency. Now, thank me and shake my hand. With Gus, Breaking Bad explores the questions, what would it be like if drug dealing was treated like any other business? And what happens when a person lives his entire life like he's a corporation? Ah, it's a businessman. <laughs> que bien, que bien. Theo is professional Gus is the opposite of what we might expect when we think drug dealer. So Gus becomes a foil to the other drug dealers we get to know in Breaking Bad, especially Tuco, Hector, and even Walter. Animals. Tuco Salamanca is driven by impulse. For it. I don't need your punk ass to vote for me! Every move Gus makes is calculated to pay off. I investigate everyone with whom I do business. But careful, man, wouldn't. Tuco controls his minions with fear and erratic rage. Gus reads people and manipulates them with just the right type of positive reinforcement. Three million dollars for three months of your time. His phrasing here gratifies Walt's ego by emphasizing how important he is, how valuable his time is. What was the offer, if I may ask? It's uh, three million for three months of my time. Hector Salamanca is an old-school drug dealer, governed by rules like blood for blood and family before everything. La familia es todo. But Gus recognizes these principles as ineffective. This is what comes of blood for blood, Hector. Sangre por sangre. The only family Gus seems to care about are his employees. Those men outside are my trusted employees. And even then, still only to the point that they help his businesses and aren't a liability. Like Tuco, Hector solves problems by threatening his rivals. But Gus, even when baited, remains completely professional, composed. Adding more product will threaten the reliability of the entire operation. And doesn't reveal himself. Hector and Gus are set up as lifelong foes in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul because, in addition to their bad blood, they are existential opposites. Each seems offended by the other's very nature and can't abide his way of operating in the drug business. Walter, with his scientific and reasoned approach, is more similar to Gus, or so he'd like to think. I was told that the man I would be meeting with is very careful, a cautious man. I believe we're alike in that way. But Gus knows better. I don't think we're alike at all, Mr. White. The key difference between Walt and Gus is ego. Walt secretly really wants people to see that he's finally rich and powerful. Gus never flaunts his wealth or power. You are a wealthy man now. And one must learn to be rich, to be poor. Anyone can manage and Gus sees the value in keeping up humble appearances. After all the idiots and maniacs we've seen, it's refreshing when we meet Gus. Can I help you, sir? And witness his rejection of old school thuggishness in favor of a more reasonable corporate management style. After all, we the viewers are rooting for Walt and Jesse's hardy little startup, so it's a relief to see it safe for a time under the wing of a capable parent company. Your new lab. In our American context, this feels like success. 
But over time, Gus's character also leads us to question, how is drug dealing different from other businesses? And is a corporate mindset applied to crime actually scarier than the old-fashioned ways? I need 200 pounds per week to make this economically viable. In Gus's mind, mess is a commodity, no different from the chicken he sells. He discusses his operation only in the vocabulary of business. How much product do you have on hand? Que siempre y conducio negocios con ciertos proveedores. I don't believe fear to be an effective motivator. I want investment. Professor David Pearson examines the connection between Gus's business tactics and neoliberalism. Neoliberalism prioritizes a free market. The idea is that the less involvement the government has in the market, the better it is for the economy and for the consumer. Pearson points out that for neoliberals, crime is an inevitable part of society, and it can even be a totally rational choice. In neoliberal thought, a criminal is, quote, a rational economic actor who contemplates and calculates the risks of his actions. And who embodies this type of the rational criminal, if not Gus, whose every action is dictated not by emotion, but by opportunity? Furthermore, Pearson points out that methamphetamine is just one drug among a class of performance enhancers that have, quote, become both the fuel and the product for the neoliberal fetish for productivity. Most products in this class are legal, like caffeine, energy drinks, steroids, Viagra, and prescribed Adderall, which, by the way, is very close to meth chemically. But looking at this list, it's clear that meth is hardly the only product that's highly profitable and desired while also being harmful to consumers. And if you think about it, how different is a typical large company from Gus's drug empire in terms of the collateral damage it causes? Even if most major global corporations don't trade drugs that directly kill people, many cut corners in ways that damage lives and the planet. It's basic, simple money laundering, and HSBC had its hand right in the middle of it. Drug cartels themselves said, you know, in their own words, it is the place to bank. Look at it this way. Gus sells two things. One is a popular consumer product that's targeted at low-income populations and with long-term consumption can contribute to disease and death. The other is methamphetamine. One taste, and you will know. So through Gus, the show communicates that if the first priority is always profit, consumer well-being will come second. And so will employee well-being, for that matter. By showing us this fearsome drug dealer businessman, Breaking Bad points out that the ruthlessness, immorality, and harm we tend to associate with crime are less connected to the drugs part than to the business part of Gus's operation. Pollos hermanos or something delicious is always cooking. So with Gus, Breaking Bad shows the dangers of the capitalist model, which does undeniably, like Gus, appear so attractive for a while. Some argue that Gus's inspiration for building his drug empire was to avenge the death of his partner, Maximino. Gus certainly is fixated on torturing the person who killed his partner, Hector Salamanca. And Gus embodies the maxim that revenge is a dish best served cold. By waiting and crafting the perfect plan, he maximizes his enemy's suffering. Don Elalio, Don Paco, Cesar, Reynaldo, Fortuno, Cisco, and Luis. Escalada, all dead. The cold, burning hatred deep inside Gus, this desire to settle scores that partially drives him, may be a commentary on what's emotionally driving the ultra-ambitious leaders of corporations, too. This clip from the show Billions supports a similar idea. Hate is nature's most perfect energy source. It's endlessly renewable. Yet the show doesn't fully resolve the mystery of whether this controlled, festering hate causes Gus's need to succeed, or if he's already programmed to seek corporate success, and the vengeance motive is simply extra fuel. Gus was set on selling meth before Maximino's death. Este producto 
Es la droga del futuro. And if his only priority were vengeance, he could have had that cold satisfaction a lot earlier. He poisons all of Don Eladio's associates only when the timing is right, when he can't afford to work with them anymore because the cartel's animosity toward him, combined with Hank's suspicions, might result in him being found out. Thus, the primary motive in this takeover isn't revenge, but growth. The goal every corporation reaches for above all, no matter the cost. In a competition-based marketplace, a business is considered healthy only when it's constantly growing, overcoming competitors, and claiming new territories. I have a very large investment in this. There's so much overhead that I can't afford to shut down, not even for a week. Clearly, more crystal meth is worse for society, so growth in Gus's case is a negative for public health. But the same can be said of many corporations who are so set on growing that they have no concern for public health, for the environment, or for whether the world actually needs more of their product. So with Gus's growth mentality, Breaking Bad is subtly questioning the values underlying capitalism itself. Gus's dual nature as a person is also a commentary on the split between the outward faces of corporations and their true inner operations and intentions. On the surface, Gus is a benevolent philanthropist and a model citizen. Gus Fring is a pillar of our local business community. He provides jobs and security for hundreds of people. My friends, I promise you that together we will prosper. All right. <laughs> But the bottom line with Gus is always what's best for business. I hide in plain sight, same as you. And the show highlights the dissonance between his warm public persona and his cold, private mind. A DEA hero should never have to pay for a meal at Pollos Hermanos. To convey this duality, Giancarlo Esposito plays Gus with small, disconcerting incongruities in his speech and physicality. Gus smiles often, but his smile doesn't reach his eyes. Do it. Gus's warm and cordial exterior reminds us of companies' consumer-friendly speak in their advertising and PR campaigns, but that down-to-earth rhetoric is often at odds with their coldly profit-driven agendas. Yes, the old ways are still best at Los Pollos Hermanos. Ultimately, Gus's two faces are capitalism's two faces. At first, we're fascinated by Gus, and we see a lot of the positive face. There's his focus on an achievement of success, his somewhat self-made nature, his discipline, his meticulous organization, and his amazing work ethic. But over time, we see more of the negative face, the lethal, cold, inhuman bottom line. I will kill your wife. I will kill your son. I will kill your infant daughter. By the end, Breaking Bad shows the ugly truths of the capitalist mentality through Gus's character. It reveals the destructiveness of the winner-take-all, growth-obsessed mindset, a mindset that we can trace to many of our crises in recent decades. The dot-com bubble, the financial crashes of 2008, the recent Facebook data scandal, and when it comes to drugs, today's opioid epidemic was largely brought on by the corporate pushing of oxycodone for huge profits the founding of corporate drug empires that are somehow legal. In the moment of Gus's death, his two faces become literal, and his final gesture is to straighten his tie, a detail which perfectly captures who he's become. In his last moments on Earth, Gus isn't thinking about loved ones or seeing his life flash before his eyes. He's just correcting his outer presentation. There's a hollowness in this final gesture that tells us the man inside him is gone. Only the capitalist is left, driven to the end by appearances and effectiveness. An empty husk of a man wearing an impeccable suit. If you have a complaint, I suggest you submit it through our email system. Maybe you're thinking of creating your own startup like these two, but one that's, you know, legal. If you are, you should check out Skillshare's classes on business and entrepreneurship. They're taught by seasoned pros like Gary Vaynerchuk, who grew his family's business from $3 million to $45 million. I love social media because it sells shit. This class is really to kind of 
<laughs> take the IP that sits in this brain and transfer it to people and give them kind of the foundation and the framework to understand that we're living through a context world, not just a content world. Plus, Skillshare has classes in design, photography, social media, videography, animation, and more. In fact, Skillshare has actually helped us at Screen Prism learn more about animation and design. They offer 18,000 classes about any skill you might want to learn, all for less than $10 a month. Right now, you can get two months access to all their classes for free, but that's only if you're one of the first 500 people who click the link in our description below. It's a great deal, so hurry up and don't miss out. 